For this week's critical thought, we're going to be once again talking about the difference between raw or just pure power when it comes to graphics versus aesthetics, aka the AAA versus indie kind of debate. But we're going to throw an extra little twist in on it this week, as I also want to talk about a third area where most developers don't really think about, and I honestly can't think of any indie developer off the top of my head that managed to achieve this point. The last 10 years has been a very low mark or high mark example of the power of aesthetics over art when it comes to game development and has been one of the turning points in terms of kind of the growing conversation around indie development and the viability of it as a platform. When we look at just how far games have come, decades are often just raggedy huge departures from what was at the beginning to where we were at the end. We could see this from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s and of course the last decade, with a variety of indie games being released. But art versus aesthetics is always a tough point to nail down, and it, it is often the differentiators between a bad looking game, a great looking game, and a master class level game. And while many developers don't exactly want bad looking games, it is very hard to get to a master class when it comes to the aesthetics of a title. It's something many developers have strived to do, even those that have gone with unique aesthetics, but they fail to hit every point. So, as always, when we talk about aesthetics and art, art is essentially the raw graphical power of an engine. The differences between something like Game Maker and something like the uh, Frostbite engine from EA. You know, do we render things in pixels? Or can you see every last hair on my arm fully rendered in uh, 4K HD graphics? And for the longest time, when it came to graphical power, the AAA industry had this lock, stock, and you know, two smoking barrels, basically. When you have companies that can pour millions, in some cases hundreds, of millions of dollars into video game development, advertising, and so on, you can get the best looking graphics. And that, of course, affords you to use the best looking engines, with many AAA studios having their own internal or company-wide engine. Again, Frostbite being EA's major example. But something happened over the last decade. The power and just general usability of public engines, Game Maker, Unity, Unreal, even stuff like RPG Maker, and I am forgetting probably at least two or three other ones off the top of my head right now, have grown. And it has afforded developers the ability to do a lot more with less. And this has given birth to one of the few major advantages any developers have managed to hold over AAA. And that is with aesthetics. Now, when we use the term aesthetics, we're referring to the mood or the theme that you're trying to convey, not just with the art of your game, but with all aspects, the sound design, the UI, the UX. Just what are you trying to make the player feel? Is this supposed to be a riff off of, you know, 80s horror with, uh, what was it, like a synth wave or, you know, like those very loud noises like Night of the Consumer? Is it supposed to be cartoony like Cuphead? Uh, dark and mysterious like Dark Souls? Or pick any well-known or well-recognized game and there is often a major aesthetic that goes with it. And while the power of an engine can certainly help, aesthetics will always trump raw power because aesthetics become a part of the branding of the game and becomes the unique differentiator between everything else darkest dungeon has a unique look to it you will never confuse darkest dungeon for any other game most often other games will be confused for darkest dungeon the mario games especially the 3d marios have always had a very cartoon very fancy kind of aesthetic to them along those lines and 
you will never confuse Mario for Doom or Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto. Conversely, when we look at games that just focus on art and no aesthetics, they're often a product of their times, and, they're, and if it's a part of a major franchise, it becomes very confusing to tell, you know, which game is which. Which brown and gray Call of Duty is this one? Which um, dark and dreary third-person shooter is this one? And you can see the difference when it comes to art versus aesthetic with the games that stand out and, more importantly, stand the test of time. On a recent uh, Safely Extreme cast, we talked about Team Fortress, and specifically Team Fortress 2. The first Team Fortress was very much, you know, 3D pixel, you know, using the original Half-Life 1 style. It looked decent for the time, but it doesn't really stand out. And when Valve and I think the other Rebels were working on Team Fortress 2, this was right around the time that the military shooter praise began to take over the call of duties the battlefields and so many uh, assault rifles and desert theme style games and so val decided why do why should we follow them let's do something different and they became became inspired by 50s pop art and that aesthetic became the entire tone for team fortress 2 and that tone and that style still looks good today. The game is, what, uh, 14 years old, I think, at this moment in time? And you can load that up, and you will immediately recognize Team Fortress 2. You will know every single character in the Meet the Team lineup. And while the other military shooters are have had their popularity and they wane, Team Fortress will probably last until, you know, the day the mythical meteor slams into Valve and Steam goes offline, heralding the apocalypse. The point is that strong aesthetics will always be in. And you can play a game that has amazing aesthetics when it came out. You can play it 5, 10, 20 years later, and you can still get that level of craftsmanship. Again, pixel art. There is such a wide line between good, bad, amazing, and horrible pixel art. Many developers who look at pixel art, they don't really explore that space. The original Mario games may not have, you know, cutting edge graphics today, but they're still very clean. They're still very recognizable. Many developers who aren't the best at pixel art, their games tend to end up looking worse than something from LJN. Game dev tip, don't make your games look worse than the LJN lineup. There's your a million dollar tip for the day. So, we've talked about the importance of this. Let's get to the second point. What does it mean to look at aesthetics versus art? That is about coming up with a unifying vision for how your game plays, how it looks, and how it sounds. Now, some developers will purposely clash, you know, cute and cuddly graphics, hardcore violence, swearing, profanity, and stuff I can't mention on this video here. And while that can help to a point, makes you stand out, what we found is that a unified aesthetic from beginning to end is often the best way to go. And you see, here's the point. An aesthetic is something you need to figure out as early into development as you can. Because much like the core gameplay loop, it becomes the connective tissue between all aspects of your game. And if you don't hit all aspects of your game, the whole aesthetic breaks down. Like, I've seen developers who have this amazing look for their game, the UI is all beautiful, it's unique. I go to the options menu, and they use the default Unity key rebinding for the whole thing. Or, they'll use the generic, you know, um, somewhat transparent box with white text for all the score and number info. And you don't want that. Again, what makes working with aesthetics so challenging is that everything has to 
be in line with it. When you look at a game like Greece, for instance, that is a beautiful looking game. And everything about that aesthetic flows into the gameplay loop. When you look at something like, um, what was that, a Bug Fables, and games that make use of billboarding, like a Spookware, um, that game from uh, Halcyon 6 developers that I'm completely blanking on at the moment, and so on. That when you have a strong aesthetic, it needs to fit everywhere in your game. And if you have to change your aesthetic or you have to come up with an aesthetic further into game development, you're going to have to throw a lot of stuff to once again work with that aesthetic. And heaven forbid if you decide to completely go from one aesthetic change to another aesthetic, you know, halfway to three quarters through of your game, good luck with that. But like I've said, the big point is that you want everything to be in line. This goes back to something that I talked with Ernest Adams about a few years ago, about kind of harmonizing game design. That when everything fits into place, it creates a game that is greater than the sum of its parts. And when a strong aesthetic is combined with amazing gameplay, these are often the titles that go on to be Game of the Year winners, or the ones that most people talk about. Disco Elysium, Celeste, Hades, and just pick every major winner from the indie space in the last 10 years. Darkest Dungeon again. So far in this video, we've talked about why just having raw graphical powers don't hold up. We've talked about why aesthetics will always triumph and why a strong aesthetic can do so much to help a game, there's still one more point left to discuss. And that is when the gameplay is directly tied to your aesthetics. That is something that is demonstrably difficult to do. And I can't think of any indie developer off the top of my head that has managed to achieve this act. And it sounds so much harder than what I just said. And if anyone can think of some examples, let me know in the comments below. But we're going to talk about that next. But before that, a quick break. And as always, if you're interested in my books on design, then be sure to check the following out. For entry-level students, we have 20 Essential Games to Study, and then the Game Design Deep Dive series that takes an extensive look at different genres with horror coming by the end of 2021. So as I said in the last part, when we talk about the very best use of aesthetics, it not only goes on to define the UI and UX of a game, but it can actually become a part of the gameplay loop itself. And it's incredibly hard to do that, and like I said, there's very few examples of it. What you're seeing on screen right here is Comic Zone. This is a very late-gen Sega Genesis title that was not easy for me to say there that involves, as you can tell by the look of it, a comic book aesthetic. Now, a lot of video games have used comic books and pop art as kind of like its overriding theme. But what makes Comic Zone a unique example and why I'm showing it here is that the actual aesthetic of being in a comic book is not just for like the tone of the game. It is a factor in the gameplay loop itself. As you can see from the footage, I am literally fighting in a comic book right now. The world is defined by the borders of each screen. If you saw a minute ago, I actually ripped or attempted to rip some of the page behind me in order to see if there's any secrets back there. And so the structure of this game is an action title with kind of a choose your own adventure style theme to it because you are free to pick which panels you want to go to, which in turn will define your route through each of the game's three levels. Now, regardless of the path, you are going to be fighting the same bosses and going along things like that. But which death traps you run into, what little plot points you discover, that's entirely different. And again, you can see right there that the animation of transitioning from one panel to the next, that is really impressive. And it's something we really didn't see. Now, there's another game that we played on stream a while ago, and I forget the name of it. 
and it had a comic book aesthetic much the same way, that each level of the game was framed as a comic book. But the difference is that instead of you exploring the panels of the comic, what happened was when the levels began, the panels just disappeared and it just became like your normal action stealth adventure game. So in this regard, the aesthetics simply define the overall experience, but they're not impacting the gameplay or the gameplay loop itself. And for another example of this, we can turn to the difference between Bug Fables and Paper Mario. Bug Fables is another indie game that we played that I still need to go back to at some point. And this game uses the same kind of billboarding paper aesthetic that was made famous by Paper Mario. Your characters look like kind of paper figurines moving around on a board. They, you know, turn around. You can kind of like, they turn like a piece of cardboard would. And it has a nice look to it. It has an aesthetic that stands out. But the problem is that that aesthetic means nothing for the gameplay. You could have used, you know, the, that kind of look in any number of games, and it really wouldn't have mattered because the aesthetic stops at, you know, how the game looks. It doesn't change how it plays. Now, the opposite example of that would be Paper Mario. In Paper Mario, Mario and everyone in the world is made out of paper, but they don't stop there. Mario folds up into a paper airplane to solve puzzles. The fact that everyone is a one-dimensional out paper becomes a factor of the puzzle solving, of the gameplay. The fact, another point, the aesthetic of you fighting on a stage, that people in the audience will throw items to help you or they'll help whoever is more popular. These are all ways that this kind of tone that was set by the world influences the gameplay loop itself. Whereas in Bulk Fables, the fact that these characters had that billboard look to them, it means nothing to the actual gameplay. You could do this gameplay with any number of aesthetic or any style of aesthetic. And as I said, this is very hard for a lot of developers to do because it requires an almost intimate understanding of your gameplay and how the aesthetics can factor into that. You're also going to need one hell of an art team or an artist on board to make sure that everything fits. But when it does, it usually leads to some very elevated titles, the ones that really do stand that test of time. And it's also why very few games will do it originally. Now, if you're asking me for you know examples or you know how to do this in your own game, I am definitely not an artist, and I cannot unfortunately help you out with that. But what I can tell you is that as you're coming up with the core gameplay of your title, see if you can figure out what the aesthetics of your game are going to be, and how can the two be combined? Because what you don't want is to have an aesthetic that just does not mean anything to the gameplay. And while developers will argue that art is hard, and again, it certainly is, in today's market, people are looking for quality. And if they don't see that in the screenshots or the trailers or whatever they're seeing of your game, they're not going to really want to engage more with it. Again, it's why uh, graphically or artistically pleasing games tend to attract first eyes on it. Because if it looks good, surely it must play good. But you need to be able to think about your game in terms of all aspects. Because if you miss out on one, then you are basically cutting each mistake is drastically cutting your game's chance of success. And like I said in the last part, there are huge differences again between good and bad pixel art, good and bad 3D, and just pick any aesthetic that you have. And you need to be able to read the market to understand what people are expecting out of it. If you're trying to make a 2D pixel style game, and again, it looks worse than games from the Nintendo era, 
you are not going to be hitting a wide market. And it's important to understand what works and what doesn't work about these games when you're doing your research. But that, of course, is another topic. So we'll wrap things up here. Again, you can think of any other examples of games that really meshed aesthetics and gameplay. Let me know in the comments. If you suggest a topic for a future video, uh, please get in touch. As always, check out our Discord and Patreon link down below. Do the liking and subscribing and smashing whatever people are telling you to do. And if you are a fan of our game streams, the archive channel is set up where all the streams that I do for our nightly plays are available there. So be sure to check that out. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where you are in science of games. Until next time, take care.